Good evening. Welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. Tonight, we're so pleased to welcome Gerardo Simano Cordova to our At Home with Literati series in support of Australia and in conversation this evening with author Kelly Link. Just a quick webinar overview for our attendees. If you're just joining us, the chat is closed, but you can keep the chat window open. We'll be sharing links to purchase Monstrilio from Literati throughout the event. Uh, you can also uh, interact with us at any time using the Q&A uh, tool, Q&A function on your screen. Uh, whenever you have a question, whenever the spirit moves you, please feel free to submit your questions. I'll read a selection of your questions at the conclusion of the conversation. And live transcription is available to you on your toolbar as well using the CC icon. As a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. Of course, if you live in Southeast Michigan, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. And if you're watching us later on YouTube, there are always links to purchase books in the description directly below me. You can also click on the typewriter icon in the bottom right corner of your screen to be to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to be kept up to date with all of our at home with literati events which will continue through 2023 once they become available there but most of all we just like to thank you for your attendance this evening uh, or this morning or this afternoon or much later this evening depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us but without further ado I'll introduce tonight's author and our interlocutor Gerardo Simano Cordova is a writer and artist from Mexico City, where he currently resides. He holds an MFA in fiction from the University of Michigan. He studied with Alexander Chi at Breadloaf as a work study scholar and with Garth Greenwell at Tin House. His work has appeared in Ninth Letter, Passages North, in Chicago Quarterly Review, and is forthcoming common. And, sp and speaking with him this evening, Kelly Link is the author of Get in Trouble, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Fiction, Magic for Beginners, Stranger Things Happen, and Pretty Monsters. Her short stories have been published in the Best American Short Stories and Prize Stories, the O. Henry Awards. She is a MacArthur Fellow and, a and has received a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. She is the co-founder of Small Beer Press and co-edits the occasional zine, Lady Churchill's Ro Rosebud Wrightslet. She is also the co-owner of Book Moon, an independent bookstore in East Hampton, Massachusetts. Her most recent book is White Cat Black. Her most recent book, White Cat Black Dog, uh, was out just last month. Please join me in welcoming Gerardo Simono Cordova and Kelly Link into your living rooms. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with a brief reading. Um, so just to set you um, in place, um, so Monstrilio, the book, <laughs> is um, it's about a family who loses their child and um, the mother cuts a piece of his lung, um, keeps it and then feeds it and the lung grows into a monster. So the book is um, divided into four different parts. Uh, narrated by four different characters. Um, we start with the mother, Magos. Um, then we continue with Lena, her best friend. Then Joseph, the father. And we end finally with M, um, the monster himself. Um, and so I'm just going to read a little bit from the start of the last part, which is M. Um, and so here we go. <clears throat> a passport is a booklet with your name and picture on it. Mine says Santiago Jansen de la Mora. Capitalized letters. It doesn't say human because only humans get a passport. Mine comforts me like an alibi. It's like a trick, the way I unhinge my jaw and stretch my lips all the way to my earlobes. My head split halfway through. But it's not a trick. I'm not trying to fool anyone. It feels good letting my fangs air out. I do this when I'm alone, preferably outside. At night, people would freak out if they saw, except Uncle Luke. He gave me a thumbs up when he saw. Purpose of visit? The passport control man asks. I live here now. He flips through my passport, looks at his computer. What were you doing in Germany? I lived there before. 
The man types fast. He could be writing, access denied, not human. I stand taller, smile, lips closed. Easy, I can be very human, though for a while I refused to. I wouldn't even go out. The world was scary. Worse, I was scary in it, in a body I had no clue how to handle, more parts than I knew what to do with. But I had Santiago's memories, his frailty and unwieldy kindness. All set, the man says. He returns my passport, waves the next person forward. I'm hungry. Uncle Luke waits for us in arrivals, pulls me into a hug, pats my cheek, grunts to ask how I'm doing. I'm fine, Uncle Luke, I say. We walk into the living room where I usually read the books Uncle Luke gives me. We leave the suitcases in the foyer. Mine is a small bag, the one pap be packed for me in Berlin. It's enough. Clothes are too much work anyway, and I like my outfit. I wear the same one almost every day. We sit. I don't have a book. Doesn't seem like the moment to read anyway. Uncle Luke grunts. Give us a minute, Pappy says. He collapses on the couch. We just got here. I ate our neighbor, I say. Bit him. I swallowed parts. He's still alive. He may die. We want him to live, of course, Pappy says. What you did was a mistake, Em, um, a bad moment. Uncle Luke picks up one of his yellow pads. I read aloud, no mistake, this is Em. Um. Pappy says, I know this is Em. Um. Telling me I am Em doesn't afford the clarity they think it does. Pappy is napping. A mistake is something you wish you hadn't done. I ask Uncle Luke if this is true. He shrugs. I say that I don't like that Elias is hurt, but that I don't wish I hadn't done it. I still keep tasting him. Very delicious. Uncle Luke grunts, but not an answer. He hands me a note. Beef tartare just for you. We go to the kitchen. Uncle Luke doesn't mind how enthusiastically I eat. He drinks red wine, pats my hand. I lick my plate. More, Uncle Luke writes. I'm still hungry, but I say I'm fine. I take our dirty plates to the sink. A sliver of pink sunset light shines on the wall in front of me. So pretty a dread grows right in my chest. On Srila love this light the best. Night is when we're hungriest and hunger can be magnificent. I stare at the half washed dishes. I fight to push the dread out. I, I pretend my time as Monstrillo is hazy. Muffled sounds and blurred colors. I say I remember warmth, but I don't say I miss my fur. I don't say I'm hungry because my hunger is what makes everyone scared. They are happy to believe I forgot how they maimed me. And that's it. Thank you. Um, I, I love this book. And, and I'll talk about some of the reasons why, but I, I'm in a hotel room. And so my setup is a little weird and I love your cover. And I actually yes. thought about doing the interview as a sort of homage where I would sort of hide down at the bottom the way that, that <laughs> this one Julio does on the cover. Um, uh, that's amazing. I have, I have a lot of questions about, about your book, but I wanted to begin by asking you a, a question that I, I stole from the writer and editor, um, David Levithan, who likes to begin conversations like this by asking, uh, what did your, what did your grandparents do? So um, my maternal grandparents, uh, my grandfather, he was a salesman for wine. Um, there's a brand in Mexico called Domecq. Um, it's a Spanish wine, but he sold it um, to restaurants and stuff. So he did that for uh, most of his life uh, here in Mexico. And then my maternal grandmother was a homemaker. She, she just, um, she took care of my mother and her brother. Um, while my grandfather traveled, um, and my paternal grandparents. Um, so my grandfather, he worked for social security in Mexico. Um, mm -hmm. so he, he, he started there almost when it began. Um, and they lived in Veracruz, which is a state in Mexico. Um, and my grandmother, she actually studied accounting, um, and she used to help her uncles um, with accounting in their businesses. And she also studied um, 
uh, hairdressing um, and also uh, sewing and these things. So she had like, so she had like a university career, which was accounting, but she also had, um, she, for a while, she had a, her own salon for hairdressing. Um, and so she did a lot of things. And then when they moved, because they were in Mexico City, and then when they moved to Veracruz, um, she stopped working uh, professionally, I guess. Um, and and they, uh, and she took care of, of her three, um, well, two sons and a daughter. So that's what they did. Yeah. Thank you very much. I don't know why that's so satisfying, but it 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 always is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is. You you get to know people. Yes. Um. What was what was the starting place for this novel? So, um, I guess I was thinking a lot about love and how um, families love people, and if love had like a limit. Um, if love could ever break, um, which is kind of like a scary question, <laughs> but also like one I wanted to explore. Um, and so at the beginning, when I started writing the book, it was with Mago San Lena and they kind of, they found like, um, a boy that needed their help, but they, he, he didn't speak very much. So they didn't know what was happening. Um, so that was like the very, very start of the book. Um, but then it kind of changed because I, I kind of wanted the family to be a little bit more connected. And so um, a, a little less random or coincidental. And so I wrote as an experiment, what if Magos um, had a child? Um, and also the idea, I, I always had the idea that this person had to be terrible somehow and I love monsters and so I thought like why why isn't he like an actual monster um and so the idea developed from that what if a family had to love a monster um and what would happen would they still love him would 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 wouldn't they um and so and the idea of Santiago dying the son um came because I thought I can't force a family to love a monster really. And like the only way I could figure out how was if the family was grieving and they had all this love without a place to live. Um, and so in comes Monstrelio and they deposit that love in, onto him. And so the whole novel is that journey of the family. I, I think that maybe for readers too, if you are a reader, um, characters are very easy to love, no matter how badly they behave. And Monstrelio is is very lovable, uh, despite sort of the the fact that uh, he does uh, monstrous things. Um, there's a, a housekeeper, Jackie, uh, who says fairly early on in the first section, um, "I don't like hungry things," yes. uh, which, which is uh, sort of a for me, I it made me think a lot about um, the ideas that we have um, culturally about hunger being monstrous, right? Um, and and the idea of some kinds of hungers being unnatural. The idea that the dead are hungry, or that a revenant is hungry. The idea that that Monstrilio is 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 incredibly hungry. And I wondered if you would talk a little bit about that, that idea of, of sort of monstrous appetite. Right. Um, so I'm very interested in the idea of hunger and desire um, because it's like, I feel like it's something very innate to us. And like you said, um, I like that you said some hungers are not very well <laughs> liked or like very well received in our society, but some hungers are. Um, like ambition and like professional ambition and things like that are very celebrated. Um, but certain hungers are definitely not. Um, and there's puritanical things that happen um, where like sexual hunger is very um, limit, like it's very, uh, society limits it a lot. Um, and, and then there's like actual hunger, <laughs> like wanting to eat food. Um, that's also very controlled um and it and it almost it, it goes into this idea of 
self-control and that this idea of what we as humans have valued that being instinctual is not being very human, it's being more animal. Um, and I kind of wanted to challenge that idea because we all have these hungers and we all have these desires. We just see a lot of them as wrong or as letting our baser instincts take over. Um, and it's this idea of like, but they exist and how can we learn to deal with all these things that we have if we can't even like talk about them or if we are told that they're wrong from the onset, right? Um, that they're monstrous. And so this idea that Monstrilo is hungry all the time, um, I, I, I don't think the idea that he's hungry all the time is monstrous by itself, but we make it monstrous, right? Also, he eats humans, so that part is, is kind of monstrous. Uh, but um, the idea itself of just being hungry, it's not monstrous. It's just like our body needing, needing something. Um, and so it's that balance of what we are intrinsically versus what we're supposed to be in society or to actually um, relate to people in like a peaceful, congenial way. Um, and so I kind of wanted to explore that. I don't have any real answers on what to do, but I kind of like wanted to explore that. And it's very interesting to me that 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 hunger and that desire, um, because it's very much present in all of us. We have just been taught to suppress it and to like channel it in like very restricted ways. Um, I think that there's also a lot, uh, there's, there's a very strong connection between um, the idea of appetite uh, and the idea of, of family love. I'm thinking about how we talk about babies. Um, you know, baby, they smell delicious. Um, yeah. People will say, I could eat you up, you know, yes. that, and then they have it flip. So instead the, the sort of, um, you know, Monstrilio is, is first, Santiago, um, a, a human child, and then this this um, this sort of this this tiny monster, uh, a little bit opossum like, a little bit bat like, um, yeah. you know, with with appendages that that uh, his parents feel shouldn't be there. He's sort of uh, cut down to to human size, um, right? And even as Mon Monstrilio, he he has access to Santiago's memories and and the first version of himself. Um, right. I was, I was, I was thinking, uh, you know, this is a, it's a, it was a very good book for me to read. I, I, uh, my husband and I, we had a very premature baby who spent uh, a very long time in a NICU uh, because of her right. lung. And so oh, this wow. case struck a, a very personal chord for me in part right. because before she was born, I thought, I, I don't know how I feel about this. I will have a baby, but I, I don't know what that will be like. I don't know what right. loving a baby will be like. And then as right. soon as she was born, she was, you know, she was in many ways, uh, barely fully human. Um, right. She was tiny and, and right. she did not have a lot of the things that we associate with being human, including layers of skin. But I did love her, even right. though she was quite monstrous to right. look at and required a lot of very monstrous things to keep her alive right um what was what was the first monster um that you were um ever afraid of when you were a well kid? I think my own body <laughs> I think uh so I was born with a condition called osteogenesis imperfecta which makes my bones brittle and so when I was very young, I broke my bones a lot of times. So I learned to be very careful because of my parents and like my sister, they were always very careful with me. And so I learned to be very careful with my body because if I like jumped a little bit, or if I like ran too fast or like things like that, I would break something. Um, and so I didn't know. I mean, I didn't know what it was to have like a healthier body, I guess. But at the same time, I knew that my body was not the norm. Um, and so just, just encountering that disconnect between what I saw other people have and what I didn't have and what they could do and what I couldn't do, I blamed my body. 
Um, and so that was like the first discon because I thought like, I'm very good in my mind, <laughs> but, I'm, but like my body does not reflect everything that I could or wanted to do. Um, and so it took like a long time for me to accept my body for what it was and to see like the good things about its resilience because it always healed. Um, and so, but at the beginning, it was like this separate thing that kind of like, I felt like it wanted to destroy me, um, which is not true, but like, I felt that way. And so that was like my first um, relationship to something that I felt was monstrous because at any moment, even like I felt guilty that I was breaking my body, but at the same time, it wasn't really my fault. I was just like doing basic things. So it was like, I felt like my body could be mean or nasty towards me. Um, and so it was like that, that entity that existed that kind of like pushed me um, to think about those things. And also just, and then like when I started to like read more about monsters and like encountering monsters in film and TV and everything, um, I, I saw like the beauty in monsters and like how like there's this immediate like um, rejection from society, but at the same time, monsters are not necessarily monstrous just because they're monstrous inherently. Um, they're kind of made that way in many instances or how you look at it. Um, it depends on the light you look at it. Um, and so um, I couldn't, I can't shake my condition away. It's gone better because after puberty it got better, but um, it's not something that it's cured or it's just treatable, I guess, um, by not doing crazy things like jumping too high or something like that. But um, but it is a something that you live with and that you have to kind of like it's the same body, but you have to shine. I had to shine a different light to it or, or else I would just be angry all the time or just like disconnected. I think that um, I I love monster stories. I love monsters. Um, and I think both in fiction, but also in film or TV, they're very beautiful and they're very resilient. You know, yes. monsters are very, very, hard to kill in yes. ways that, that feel, um, you know, the damage is, is uh, never permanent in ways that, that are appealing. Um, yeah. Was, was there a, a monster, um, you know, as you read or watched, uh, watched movies, was there a monster that you loved? Well, um, Frankenstein um, kind of like stands out just because, <laughs> there's like two parts to it. Like, so Frankenstein, like Victor Frankenstein, as soon as he sees his creation, he's like, no, he's horrible. Like, let's just get rid of it. You know, he, he immediately rejects his creation, the monster, um, without giving it any chance at all. And then you get like this whole section of the book, which is just the monster um, trying to, find someone who would accept him for who he was he was like I'm a good person you know like I don't even know if I'm a person but I'm like a good being um and so but then he received so much rejection that he goes into like this whole revenge thing but um but it really is about like like that discussion between like um being inherently wrong as Victor Frankenstein thought the creature was and the creature knowing that he's not inherently wrong, but that people can't just can't see it. And so he kind of becomes the image that they want him to be. And so that that was one of like the earlier monsters that I remember like encountering and being like, oh, wow, this is a different take or, you know, like um, or ghosts like ghost stories because ghosts can be like scary, but usually in ghost stories, like the ghosts just need something from, you know? Um, and so ghost stories also kind of like stand in this like weird um, liminal space um, of what what is monstrous and what is not monstrous and what like the ghost wants to do 
when like the people that are in like the haunted house or whatever want like they're scared but maybe the ghost is not necessarily intrinsically scary um it just like what they want is opposite maybe this clarifies for me i think one of the things that i i love about ghosts um for one thing ghosts are sort of the the boiled down essence of who somebody was there, you know, the thing that remains because it was essential in some way, but also right. the, the desire to communicate and that, that representation, that, that communication is, is difficult. You know, the ghost stories are, yeah. ghost stories, somebody, the ghost needs to tell something, exactly. but that is so hard to communicate what right. that, is, and I find that uh, something about that really, really strikes a chord with me. Yeah, me too. What does um, working with with the fantastic or the gothic or trope horror tropes um, allow you to do as a, a writer? I think um, so. For horror, I think there's like a very visceral reaction to horror, and I love that. Um, it's not. I think. In my own personal life, I go through life more in my head than in my feelings. Um, but when I write, I guess it's like an outlet for me to like experience things more viscerally. And I find that really valuable for me. And also when I read, I, I really like that. Um, even though I can appreciate a very cerebral book uh, and it's very satisfying, um, I think the books or like um, the narratives that stay with me the most are the ones that connect to me on like a gut level. And I think horror does that. Um, I think there's there's this uh, reaction that 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 cannot be processed um, consciously at first, at least. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in that. Um, I was reading someone who was like com who compared horror to melodrama and pornography um, because uh, she said like these three things employ the visceral to, to tell something, right? Um, and I found that fascinating also because melodrama is very maligned, but I still have like a soft spot for melodrama. <laughs> And I think it could be done, like it can be done really, really well. It's just like, it's not, not everybody does it really well, but like there's so much and there's such an appeal, like a human appeal. Um, and coming from like a country where like telenovelas are so big and like I watched a lot when I was younger. Um, so it becomes part of how you experience and how you you learn to tell a story um, and then you can refine it or you can use it your own way. But like all those things that are a little bit more tangible and like visceral I really find that um really interesting and the fantasy part is because also I grew up reading a lot of Latin American authors and the ones I read used a lot of fantasy in there but there's like a whole tradition of like in Latin America for narratives to contain otherworldly things or the uncanny and things like that and so when I was growing up I thought like uh, engaging with the uncanny was part of writing. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought it was like a natural thing that had to happen. It was only later that I realized that realism is also a thing. <laughs> so it's like kind of like a little bit <laughs> the other way. Um, but I, I, I love, and that's why like all those stories really appeal to me. And so that's also why I like them. I, I also love melodrama with all of my heart. And I think uh, I, and like you, I know that uh, from, for the, that there are people who watch or read it and it feels cheap or sensationalist, yeah. but one, I don't think there's anything wrong with sensationalism or with sensation. Right. Um, and two, uh, the possibility that really surprising big things can happen yeah and then keep on happening exactly me, feels in much more in alignment with my life uh, and with where yeah. we are sort of in, in reality that it it 
it allows my my feelings about the things that are happening in the real world uh, to be more organized, maybe, or at least to have a more pleasing pattern. Um, yeah, reading or watching. Yeah, exactly. And this kind of push because stoicism, which is kind of like a little bit opposite of melodrama, it's also like a cultural thing. It's not like how we're all supposed to be or like how polite society should all, you know, like, um, so there's different ways of engaging with the world that are not necessarily what has been like coded in our brains or in like our ways of behaving, especially in certain cultures. So, yeah. I, I do not mean to this fiction, which is extremely realistic, but um, I, when, to me, like when I get together with friends, we don't tell each other about the very basic things that have happened to us during the day. What we tell each other about are the surprising things or the things that we don't quite have sort of a framework for. And that's, that's right. why I'm telling them is because they were large or they were strange or they, 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 um, they shocked us. Right. Um, but that, yeah, that that's so the true. Basic, current of of talking with family and with friends yeah exactly there's yeah it's what stood out to you and like what made you feel things and um and the processing of all those things that is you know interesting and valuable you have uh worked with um some of my favorite writers uh and I was wondering um if you wouldn't mind um talking about um, either the best or the worst writing advice um, that you've been given. What, what seemed useful to you as a writer? Or maybe what, what you had to sort of discard because it didn't actually help you do the things that you needed to do. Right. So I guess like um, some valuable advice, um, especially for revision, um, was um so garth greenwell he mentioned how like syntax can also show emotion <laughs> like the the way a, a character's inner mind is working and that was really interesting to me um because that's also a way to enter a reader's subconscious <laughs> with feeling and with um, just the way a sentence is constructed. Um, and maybe that sounds obvious, but to me it wasn't. <laughs> um, and so it, it 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 just like made another tool to really think about how how you're processing things and how that would come out in a narrative, right? And like uh, the brain processes, if like your sentences are longer and like, well constructed in clauses and things like that maybe it's because you're in a moment that you can actually produce that kind of like action consequence all those types of things but if it's more disjointed maybe it's just because you can't really process um how how all these things relate you just have to like let them spill out and hopefully seeing them all lay down um you see the connections that start forming. Um, and so that was really valuable. Um, and advice I hate, and, and, and I've heard this from other people um, and like bad blogs and things like that. It's like the, the advice that restricts like a specific usage of a specific word or type of word, I find very restrictive. Like don't use adjectives or, or don't use this type of word too much or blah, blah, blah. I find there's value in noticing if you have like crutches maybe that you use a lot just to um, get on. But especially at the beginning stages, I feel like it's super restricted for me. Um, and it's just like, I'll just write however many adjectives or whatever word I want it. And then later you can see if it works or if it doesn't. Um, but but those hard and fast rules of like what good writing is, I, I really, I, I kind of like reject them instinctively. Mm -hmm. I, I have uh, taken an online seminar from Garth Greenwell 
and his ability to explicate or sort of uh, go through a paragraph and talk about what language is doing and how it connects to emotion was um, a masterclass in every single way. And, <laughs> and like you, you know, I, I think that I would probably need to take about seven or eight more seminars <laughs> before I could retain all of it. Yeah, but exactly. I, I, you know, I, now when I, I write, I do have, you know, a small piece of of him yeah my yeah brain. yeah and he explains it so well I probably just butchered what he said before, no, but but uh, <laughs> but uh but yeah and, and he has so much to say um yeah so like those little nuggets I I like try to retain as best I could well the idea that 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 language or sentences are are beautiful or not beautiful is is such a as you I think as you you know as you become a writer the idea that that sentences have to be one thing or that that we should work towards a beautiful sentence when in fact a sentence which is out of joint or ugly or or trite in some way may actually be the kind of sentence that you need to convey a state of mind or an emotion or a way of seeing the world the the absolutely yeah. yeah yeah you touched on this a little bit um but uh was there a, a book when you were younger that made you want to be a writer um so i the first book i remember it's like a kids book um so in the Spanish language, there's these books for children by different authors. I'm, I'm not even sure how they're, how they get them or how they got them because they're kind of older. I don't know if they're still being um, released newly, but the series is called Barco de Vapor and they had like different tiers depending on your reading level. They were really amazing stories. And so like the blue, I think was like the easiest ones. And then there was like orange and red. Um, and so I read a lot of the orange ones um, and I love them. And there was this one called The Profesión Fantasma. And I can't remember the author, but I should look it up and just like glue it on my mind. <laughs> but um, it's about a kid that goes to like an old like British estate um and then he's he's poor and so he's just trying to like find shelter so but he becomes the house ghost um and so that's how he maintains like a livelihood because he pretends to be a ghost um and that's how he gets food and like care for him like people like the family cares for him in a way um and so I, I remember reading that and being like I I want to be able to do something like this imagine like this world um yeah so I I don't know that story but um but yeah. I would like this is the thing about the stories that you read when you're a kid that you don't know the author is sometimes you spend years of your life later yeah. to track down what they were yeah um, there's a there's a story um in this novel that comes up a couple of times about a man uh who is who is taking care of a friend's apartment and and bunnies begin to appear um what is what is that story so it's by julio cortazar okay um, and it's in his book bestiario um and I know like a lot of authors have like bestiario books but that's his okay. and so it's a collection of very short stories and this one is called a letter to a young lady in Paris um and it's about this guy who is taking care of her apartment in Argentina while she's in Paris um but he's vomiting bunnies <laughs> and so the whole thing is like he keeps vomiting bunnies and the bunnies that are rambunctious that they are destroying her apartment. So he gets more and more apologetic in the short story, um, but like really anxious about the bunnies, like destroying her apartment. Um, and so he decides to destroy the bunnies and then die by suicide. Um, so it's like a whole, like, it just, it's a very, very short story in like it's epistolary. 
Um, but it's just like this man um, really being super anxious about the bunnies destroying <laughs> this woman's apartment. I, I have not read that collection, but I will track it down. Um, yeah, it's amazing. I think you'll like it. I think I will. Was there... Um... I'm sorry. Um, I have a, I have a couple more. We have like time for maybe two more questions, and then I'm, I'm gonna return you to to John for for the audience questions. So I hope that people will continue to drop questions into the Q and A box. Um, I wondered. I loved all of the points of view, all of the characters in this novel, but I wondered if if there was one that you found hardest to let go of uh, when you were writing, one that that you felt you could sort of stay in very easily i think a strange i think it was magos um like when i was writing the other points of view um uh, magos always kept creeping in and it was it was the hardest for me to let go because i always kind of like wanted to know what magos was doing even though she wasn't like sometimes in the same space or uh, or there was no reason why they would be communicating. Um, like there was like something about wanting to know what Magos was thinking or if she was like doing okay or something like that. Um, that was hard. Maybe it was also because it was like the first one that was like the most coherent at first. Um, and so she kind of like always was with me throughout the whole novel. Um, so yeah, so yeah, I think so. She was like the most the most difficult to let go, I think. Well, and and we do get to sort of check in on her throughout. And yeah. there's something very beautiful about the movement towards the point where she she is performing this this genuine grief um at, right. at the end. And then to sort of end with with um you know, this sort of family group. I don't want to say tons about the end, but it is extraordinarily moving. Um, I guess my last question for you will be, um, what are you, what are you reading right now? Um, well, I'm reading Mariana Enriquez. Um, uh, that I was trying to think of, because I'm reading it in Spanish, but it's The Dangers of Smoking in Bed. Um, and I love those short stories. Um, it, they're just bonkers <laughs> and lovely. And like, I just really admire how she ends things because it's just like a thought, like you're left with like something that happened, but you're left in like a space where this happened, but you're not given any like real sense of where to go next, which is really incredible. Um, and like a very unsettling feeling, but also very satisfying in a way. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm loving that. I'm trying not to read them all at once because I want to like savor them little by little. I love her too. And I'm, I feel a little bereft because I think I've read everything that's available now in English. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I do have one last question, which is yes. just what are you what are you working on now? Um, so I'm at the early stages of a second novel. Um, I'm really interested in zombies. I love zombies. <laughs> and so I so something's happening with zombies, but I don't know exactly like the whole mechanism yet or um, but yeah, so I'm like in that world building stage where things don't really make sense, but they're starting to make sense a little bit. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's exciting, but I'm not exactly sure where it's gonna go or anything, but um, but it's there. I am very excited about a zombie novel. <laughs> Here's John Beck. Thank you. We do have some questions from the audience. Um, Sarah writes in, I absolutely loved Monster Leo's quirky little arm tail. Where did you get the inspiration for it? Oh, wow. I can't remember. I just knew. So for some reason, I wanted Monster Leo to be able to dangle. And also, <laughs> um, I just I, I, I just found like the dangling was kind of like 
endearing. Um, and also to, for Monstrilo to have like one feature that was really important to him. Um, and so if I gave him two arm tails, it, it felt like he would have a spare or something. <laughs> so, um, I just wanted to place physical importance in one thing. Um, and also for it not to be like, just like, um, like an opossum, like a full blown <laughs> Out of possum. Um, so it has that like like the tail, but it's not really a tail, it's also an arm. So I kind of like wanted to play with that a little bit. Uh, Penny writes, uh, did you always plan to write Monstrilio from the four point of views featured? Um no, not in that very like strict, like each one gets their part. Um, it started like more like a little bit more fluid moving in and out of like characters consciousness um but that that got a little bit messy um and i i i don't know like i needed to like separate it for myself and also one of the drafts of monstrilio was like the each part was its own universe instead of like being a continued story each character got their own like it was the same family but their own little story in like a different like parallel universe which was a whole thing which um was really interesting to write and it got me to like really know the characters really well but at the same time like when you read it through it just felt like four little novellas put together instead of like a whole mm -hmm. cohesive thing uh, a viewer writes i would watch the hell out of a monstrilio movie would you be open to a screen adaptation I would, if, if like the right people want it. Um, I would love to see it too, or maybe like a limited series or something like that. That would be awesome. Um, would you want to write on something like that? There's a lot of, I, I know like, a lot of authors now are trying, are like, it used to be, I would see authors be like, oh, I don't want to touch that. And now I know of a lot of authors who are actively writing scripts. Right. I know. <laughs> I, I actually <laughs> studied film for my um bfa but i i mean i would love to consult and i would love to be involved somehow but it would be really awesome if like a great screenwriter could write the screenplay and see their take on it like mm. i think i've done what i can with most <laughs> <laughs> and i think like there are so many amazing talented people that could do other things you know mm. um Uncle Luke, uh, another of your writes, Uncle Luke and M's connection was so special as they're both outsiders in some way. Where did that come from? Did you have a similar special connection with a family member? Um, not necessarily like that, um, but just I wanted somebody to embody just like full acceptance and to see what that would look like. Um, just like no strings attached. Um, no questioning um and i wanted that to be someone similar to monstrilio um and so or to m um and so uncle luke came like that um and i just wanted to see what that would bring out in m and i loved their interactions um and so that's how it came about um william writes Congrats on your debut, Monstrilio. It's very scary. Besides Frankenstein, what other Latin American novels inspired your writing of this novel? Um, even though it's not super related, but it, it is related. Um, so it's called Fever Dream here in uh, Samantha Shrevelin, um, mm. which I love. Um, and it's that idea also of like keeping your kids safe in a way or um and it just it's just wild and wonderful, wonderful um novel. Um, I also love the short stories of Yuri Herrera. He's more sci-fi, um, and but he's amazing and he's always super cool and an inspiration. Um yeah, I think those two come to mind right now. Thank you. Um there's another question here later in the book. Magos and Lena attempt to have a life together slash romantic relationship, which the readers are informed about by a casual comment saying they didn't work out. Love the casualness. 
Can you speak a bit about their relationship and their decision for them to not work out? So when I started writing the book, it actually started with them already being together and they're together finding this kid. Um, and so for a long time, they were always together. Um, but then as the story progressed, as, and as the novel took different shapes, like they kept moving apart for some reason. And I like kind of like tried to like put them back together, but like for some reason, um, everything that had happened and like Magos and all the things that she does and Lena, all the things that she suffered because of Magos, um, there wasn't like, it, I think they will eventually, in my opinion, come <laughs> together, but not just yet. Like they need to heal a little bit more, um, especially with each other. Um, but but yeah, it's also like something I couldn't really get into in the last part because it's really about um, um, and so, but I I kind of wanted to hint that they're like at least Magos is trying in her own very Magos way to like say sorry or like apologize. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one more question. So I'd love to give Kelly an opportunity to ask one last question if there's one on your mind. I I will ask you um, if if you have a true ghost story, actually, or a story of the uncanny from your own life. Well, so and so when we get together in Mexico, we we'll, people tell stories all the time about things like this. But for a year, we lived in a city called San Luis Potosí, which is more north in Mexico. And we lived in this house that was pretty big and it had like four floors. But it, um, at that time, my father had to, he worked um, close in another state. Um, and so he would come back on weekends, but it was mostly my mother, my sister and I living in that house. Um, and then, so it was like very eerie to live only us three in that house but there was one night where my sister woke up screaming and she was like there's a man in my room and so like we all got up like my mother brought like the dog into the house um we all went like through the house like investigating if there was like somebody all together and then when my when we got to the room the dog started barking and we're like oh no um and so um, he the dog started barking at the closet <laughs> and so we were like oh what do we do do we open the closet <laughs> you know like what what proceeds here and so we're, <laughs> my, my mom is like very brave so she just like opened the door and there was nothing but the dog just kept barking and my sister was like I swear to you there was a man here um, so that was very eerie and then we just slept in my mom's room for like a couple nights <laughs> so yeah that was one of them. Thank you. Um, suitably scary note to end <laughs> on. Uh, yeah. um, Simono Cordova, thank you so much. Uh, thank Kelly Link, so thank much. you so much for joining us on At Home with Literati this evening. Hope to have you both uh, in Ann Arbor in the bookstore um, for your next books. Um, but until then, we hope you continue to be well and, um, and we look forward to to our viewers, thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at our thank next you. event. Take care. I'll have a great night. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. All. Bye.